Hello, boys and girls. Welcome to the Cool Kids Lunch Table Podcast with PJ and Mike. Now, please find yourself a seat at their table. All right, everyone. This is our 14th episode. I'm Mike. I'm PJ. And today, we're going to be reviewing the new Extreme album entitled Six. And PJ will be reviewing The Flash with Michael Keaton and Ezra Miller. Yes, Ezra Miller. Mm -hmm. The... Very odd duck that is yes. Ezra Miller. <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm going to start things off with a childhood memory. This is more of an opinion, uh, Mr. PJ. So who do you think is like the flashiest <laughs> like uh, movie star to play like a superhero or villain? And by flashiest, I mean like someone like very eccentric or, you know. I have two that I think of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the immediately that comes to mind is Jack Nicholson. Is- Never rub another man's rhubarb. <laughs> Yes, that was mine. Right? Because he's <laughs> just completely over the top. He's great in mm-hmm. that role, but completely over the top. And uh, the second one is Gene Hackman from the Superman oh. movie as Lex Luthor. It's amazing that brain can generate enough power to keep those legs moving. I don't know that he himself is over the top and eccentric and flashy, but that's how he played the, the part. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. It's, uh, and, and then Kevin Spacey does his best Gene Hackman impression to try and feel that over the top in Superman Returns. But I think those two, for me, are the flashiest, most eccentric character actors. For yeah, Superman. mine was uh, Jack Nicholson, for sure, yeah, for the Joker. And then, um, actually, Robert Downey Jr. You know, he had a yeah, really, you know he had what? a You're really right. interesting, you know, yeah. past. You yeah. Know? Uh, so no, that's, a, that's actually a really good pick, too, Robert Downey Jr. He was perfect for Iron Man just because he lived that life of that Iron Man lived in the comics, so, you know alcoholic kind of out there crazy becoming a superhero it's almost like he was born for that part but yeah but those are those are uh, a couple of good picks for the most eccentric actors to play superheroes mm-hmm. and villains yeah 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 Thank michael you. keaton could be on that list too he's a little kooky this right shot now you want to get nuts come on let's get nuts yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah well i think he's almost like a comedian i think he almost started off as somewhat of a, a yeah, comedian yeah he did you know so Imagine having the foresight to look at some of those old Michael Keaton movies and acts where he was a comedian and saying he would make a great Batman. I don't know. Tim Burton really made a mm-hmm. good choice on that one. Yeah, I think a lot of times. Um, well, I think this is an interview with Stallone where he says that uh, the '89 Batman changed action films where you didn't have to look like a superhero to be a superhero. You know, because they were all jacked up. Right. So. Um, yeah, really interesting. But yeah, I mean, Keaton nailed it. Yeah, yeah he and really I'm did. Curious later on to hear your review of how Keaton uh, was yeah, in the role. Yeah. So, but I want to start things off, folks, with the band Extreme. So let me start off with saying this, PJ. I'm not like a gigantic fan of Extreme. Okay. So, for the folks listening, Extreme is most known for the song "More Than Words," which is like that acoustic one. Um, it's one with uh, Jimmy Fallon and Jack Black. PJ was yep. telling me about they like recreated it, you know. So, which is a beautiful song. It's a beautiful it is ballad. a great song. It's one of, the, mm-hmm. I think that's one of the was that late eighties, early nineties that song came yeah, out, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And I think that is like a staple of that time period. Like everyone mm-hmm. knows that song, everyone loves that song, and it just as soon as I hear it, it brings me back to like that time period. Do you remember like they used to have like those compilation CDs? They used to be like pure moves. Yeah, yeah. They used to have monster ballads. Yes. And it was like all these like yes. uh, like glam rock. And you would have like the infomercial for that, like eleven o'clock at night on like yeah, the yeah. E network. It would be like yeah. Saigon Kick, it'd be yeah. like Cinderella, yeah. all those type bands on there. Uh, I do remember those. But that song was on there. But um yeah, so extreme the reason I'm um doing it I'm reviewing this because one of my friends, Scott, told me he's like, Hey you gotta check this out, it's really good. And I love the new single that came out. A couple of months ago, um, I'm like, that's it's a great song. It's like a kind of a throwback to like Stone Temple Pilots kind okay. of vibe, Velvet Revolver. I haven't heard it. It's really good. Um, like this is not a band I typically follow. Yeah, um, yeah. No, n- neither yeah. have I. The only reason, like I said, the only reason, the only thing I know about Extreme is they, um, um, you know, those that song. They have a song that's called uh, another big hit of theirs, Wholehearted, which is like that. You definitely heard it. I don't. Even, I'm, I'm gonna try to sing it, but <laughs> you have heard it. Um, it's like. It's like another acoustic song, yeah. which is crazy because they're really more. I wouldn't say they're a metal band. I think they have metal rock ass- band. Yeah, yeah. They, I mean, they got definitely they're a rock all band. awesome musicians and you know that kind of vibe. So they're very diverse in their sounds. But they and that guy have- has a great voice too. Yeah, yeah. His name is uh, Gary Sharon uh, Nuno Betancourt. He's like one of the best guitar players in the world. 
I think he's I think this this album and this and that that first single Rise kind of put him back into the, uh, the spotlight, you know, because he's so overshadowed. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's, there's so many great musicians, but he's really one of the best. Um, there's a guy on bass named Pat, and there's Kevin on drums. I also know about Extreme because. One of my favorite bands I always talk about is Dream Theater, which I'm going to talk about <laughs> with some of Nudo's solos. But um, uh, Dream Theater's current drummer, Mike Mangini, used to be in Extreme for a short bit. So oh. that's my only thing I know about Extreme. But um, Peter, let me just tell you some quick things about Extreme. They're from Boston. They're okay. from Boston. Um, like I said, they're most known for More Than Words and Wholehearted. They actually had a song in the movie Bill and Ted called Play With Me. I can't really recall it, but... That's well, that is one of my favorite movies. As I, I don't know if everyone knows that, yeah. but Bill and Ted, one of my favorites of all time. I didn't realize they had a song in there either. Yeah, I think it might be on the credits or something okay. like that. So, excellent. Um, and their last ab album came out 15 years ago. Um, and like I said, I don't really know their catalog, all that kind of stuff. But I think the one that's most, that album most well known is called Porno, Por Porno Graffiti. That's the one that has more than words okay. and a lot of the big hits that we know. And... Um, like I said, I really loved the single that came out a couple of, like, maybe two months ago now. And they have other singles that came out. You know, I'm like, all oh, these are, like I said, I love Stone Temple Violets. I love Velvet Revolver. It really has, like, that kind of grunge-esque, which is mm. kind of funny because grunge kind of put them and other bands right. out of business. Right. So it's funny that kind of have, like, this throwback album. And um, maybe that's why they're doing that kind of music now to kind of, yeah. if that's what took them out, maybe the, to adapt, they're a little late to the game 15 years later, but if that's what took them out, they're trying More than to, 15 years. Yeah, <laughs> uh, they're trying to so, make that kind of music to make themselves relevant again. I don't know if that's the right yeah. choice, if that's what they did. And it's and the only thing I knew about Extreme too, which is, you know, I guess is somewhat taking a shot at them, but um, it's actually Nirvana. It's an in, look it up, folks, on <clears throat> on uh, YouTube. But, um, you know, they have, you know, Kurt, you know, right. Dave and Chris. And I guess they did a tour with them, or they played a show with them, and they're calling them like schlock rock. They're kind of like beating <laughs> them up, and um, um, you know they're, they're all at different points in their career. They're right. these, you know, they're like these young kids out of a garage, mm -hmm. and you know at this point, Extreme's already established. Right. So, but um, I think, I'm sure now Dave Grohl's friends with them, and I can't see there's any bad blood. But anyway, guys, this is called the name of the album was called Six. Because guess what? It's their sixth album. So I'm just going to do a quick track by track. So they, like I do, I did know that Extreme, maybe that's why they call it Extreme, they have a very diverse sound. You know what I mean? It's very right. eclectic. Because on their album, they're going to have, from what I know, you know, uh, they're always going to have like maybe a rock song, an acoustic song, okay. like a reggae. They're always going to change it up. You know, so it's not just like a straight up thing. But I got to say, this album is just very much, like I said, a throwback to um, this alternative rock. really has like a Stone Temple Pilots, Velvet Revolver, you know, um, I want to say Guns N' Roses. I know, like, Velvet Revolver is actually right. part, yeah. you know, Guns N' Roses, but not like where it's going to have, like, that, um, uh, like, uh, Axl Rose, kind of like, oh, no, that, that kind of yeah. style. But God, more like, no one wants that anymore. More songs that are going to sound like um, the one from the Terminated soundtrack, Going Blank, uh, oh, crap. You Can Be Mine, that's mm -hmm. it. That that kind of, like, rock okay. edge. That kind of, that's the vibe. So, yeah, the first song off is called Rise. That's the first single. This is a freaking awesome song. Like I said, it's very much like, I just picture uh, Scott Weiland singing this song. Um, I wish they played it more on the radio. I mean, they play it on, uh, you know, local rock stations. Right. Here in New York, we have The Shark, which is basically um, the second version of 92.3. I was going to say, it's like the new K-Rock, The yeah. Shark. Yeah. K-Rock, for those who don't know, used to be where Howard Stern used to be here in New York. That's yep. which which was then broadcast throughout the country, but K-Rock was his home. And once Howard left for satellite, K-Rock was, that station has never been the same. No, they, they um, went through a whole bunch of different types of things. They became like talk radio yeah, for a while. Free FM. Free FM, and then they were yeah. country, I think, for a while. Yeah. I don't Eddie know what Van, they were. Eddie Van Halen, uh, what's his, David Lee Roth was a host. He was the host, yeah. He was awful. Um, but that's another reason why, actually, that's the reason why I wanted to review it, because I feel like, just music in general right now. I feel like since 2010, music has gone on a decline. I, obviously, rock is my favorite type of music. But, like, what other rock bands are there? There are none. You know, like, I'm talking about, like, a staple rock band. We don't have that. We don't have another Nirvana. Like, you got to count Coldplay. But they're early 2000s. Like, what? Right. Like, Greta Van Fleet. I mean, they're good. But, I mean, like, 
You don't have these like monster bands, or even like monster. I know you could say some like Taylor Swift is huge, or Drake. Or, She's a rock band. Or, She's just a, a yeah, singer songwriter I mean, like, that hit big and now makes pop yeah. music. There isn't any rock bands yeah, left. So I feel like I almost felt compelled. I'm like, I got, I, we, we need some more rock out there. You know. I just so. don't think it's popular enough to sustain a big band like that for whatever reason. The the old bands that exist still yeah. exist because they already have a fan base. New rock bands, I don't think uh, I don't think they're gonna make it. There's a few out there that are pretty good. I think Ice Nine Kills. I don't know if you've heard them. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you call them rock or you want to call them metal, but they're yeah. pretty good. But they're never gonna reach the heights that an old school rock band would reach. It's just not mm-hmm. gonna happen. But even a, like, I'm just you know I want to go off a whole tangent here. But even certain types of music, like even rap, I feel rap like they call it hip hop now. Right. Yeah, like, I don't really consider like Drake. I don't I don't really like him that at all. Really, besides maybe one or two songs. But I like Drake. Like, I don't have a problem with his music, but yeah. I wouldn't call him rap. Yeah, like yeah. all that stuff. Like I love Post Malone, but it's, he's really more eclectic. I think right. he's very. But it's certain. I don't know. I can't explain it. Like you don't have your M and M's like these powerhouses anymore. No, like, it's. I think the really, industry has uh, changed. I know these. Are, I'm talking about these are legends that I'm talking yeah. about, like Eminem and you know Snoop and all that. But you don't have like the next like. The next. I don't, think, I don't think those things are gonna happen anymore. You know what I mean? The, it's, I think all I, that's. All I just those think guys it's short lived. The fame is short lived. They come out with like a really big song that kind of takes over the radio for a couple of months. Maybe mm-hmm. they. They get a follow-up album. They get a couple of years, but then the world moves on from the artist. I mean, not that he was the best rapper of all time, but someone like a Macklemore came out with that Thrift Shop song. Yeah, that yeah. Thrift Shop song was huge. Mm-hmm. And now, and you would think someone that came out with that kind of song would have like lasted a little while because yeah. of how popular it was. Yeah. And then that guy disappeared, and you haven't heard another song from him since. Yeah, Macklemore. Was this Macklemore was his friend's name? Like Macklemore? Or I don't remember all the names. I was not. I just remember the Thrift Shop song. <laughs> Mac, I think. That guy could be anything. He may not even have a name. The other guy, right? I feel like Macklemore, like somehow trans, like they're like a trans, but they transformed into Magic yeah. Dragons. Yeah, I feel like those lead singers or whatever they could almost be interchangeable. Yeah, they look almost like almost like they have like red hair or something. But um, yeah, cr- crazy with the state of music right now. Um, but that's why I like this album because, like I said, the, the first tune is a lead single. Like I said, it's called Rise, and it has an awesome killer guitar solo. You know, I mean, like. Well, that's another thing. What happened to guitar solos in music? Or any kind of... Or anything. Like, where's the saxophone solo? <laughs> in songs like... You have R&B. Yeah. You need something sexy. You know, anything. Keyboards, organ, I don't know. Um, the next song is another single. It's called Rebel. Like I said, this allows... They really channel the inner Stone Temple Pilots. Um, really good drums in this song. I said it actually sounds vocally a little bit like early Tool. Like an undertow. Oh, okay. Yeah, like kind of like... Like Maynard... Uh, I would say he almost had like a southern accent mm-hmm. in that album. So uh, I feel like the singer Gary kind of channels that. Um, and I compared to uh, Nuno's guitar solo to a John Petrucci type style, which is from Dream Theater. Uh, so really good solo. The next song is called Banshee. Um, like I said, I'm a, a broken record here. They sound like very STP. If you remember the song Big Bang Baby by them, mm-hmm. um, it sounds like that. Velvet Revolver, very catchy and groovy. The next song is called other side of the rainbow um i gotta say good lyrics on this album very good i'm not sure who writes it i'm assuming the guitar player maybe and and gary the singer um but yeah this has like it sounds like a collective soul it's acoustic it's a love song they're very good with harmonies um collective soul i haven't heard about them in forever yeah, they, either yeah. Do they still exist yeah, yeah yeah they're actually one of the best selling bands of the 90s well yeah i didn't know yeah. they were still they still making music though yeah 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 well, good for them yeah. mm-hmm they just played at the Paramount here on Long Island. Oh, yeah. shit. I wanted to see them, but I didn't. I would have went. I had no idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wanted to go. It was like on a Sunday night. Um, but I would definitely see them. Um, and, and, and with this song, they sound like one of my favorite bands, Days of the New. Um, yeah, it was impressive. And um, sometimes I feel, you know, I think when I talked about my Metallica uh, review on our other pod, uh, episode, I can't remember which one it was. But I feel like with Nuno... Plus, you a lot of like these virtual so guitar players. Sometimes I feel like they have like like a scratch solo right, where right. They, they just improvise, mm-hmm. and that's the solo. And sometimes right. I feel like I've, what they're playing is obviously amazing and technical and fucking sick. But um, sometimes I wish it'd be a little bit more melodic, you know. But right. sometimes you almost get sounds that start to sound alike. But it's a sick solo regardless. But I think it's a, if I had to bet my money, I think it's a scratch solo. This next one is called "Small Town Beautiful." Um, I feel like these guys are very, very, very romantic, mm. which is right up my alley. Um, <laughs> um, it's a ballad, really vocally, really good. Um, 
This is like a song you would feel like you would see like in a chick flick movie. Okay. Or like a or someone's wedding song. You know, they're walking in, this whatever, you know, they're coming down the aisle, their first dance. Right. That kind of song or a montage, you know, mm. kind of thing. And the solo reminds me of uh of Coldplay's uh uh, yellow, that kind of like pitch band in the beginning. I'm not that big a fan of Coldplay. I got, I'm, I'm so done I with just, them, man. I can't listen. to I them. love that album, I "Rush the Blood to the Head." The first album's not that good. Parachute. No, it's, it's, it's not. It's, it's so uh, they had hits on there. Yellow. Uh, I hate. First Soul. of all, I don't even want to hear that song. I don't even like that song. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I just, I don't want to. I'm His not voice. Go, What's his name? It's Chris so Martin? grating. It just goes after right through. While, it's like nails on a chalkboard. After a while, it can get rare. I can't. Uh, I don't want to listen to it. And I, I feel like now they're not. They should be a rock band. Uh, you know, they were. They, I consider them rock. Okay? I don't consider them rock. I consider you know, them but, garbage. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> we like better Coldplay or U two because they, um, off, they listen, compared often. I know. Well, and that's probably why I don't like either one. If I had to pick, <laughs> I guess I'd pick Coldplay. But I mean, it's a right, it's right, a real right. Sophie's choice. Can they? Can I get rid of both of them? Right. <laughs> <laughs> and not listen to music anymore. Right. Those are my two options. I feel like with Coldplay, after Rush of Blood to the Head, it became really like, I don't know, electronica is the right word, but it's, like, I don't know. I feel like when you're not having guitars anymore, I don't feel like I'm not hearing the drums, you know. I feel like all of a sudden, like that song's a Viva La, Viva La Life or something like that. It's terrible. You know, like dun, 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 dun. It's dun, terrible. That, and didn't like, they I also feel like Clocks? Is Clocks one of their Yeah, songs? Clocks is theirs. It's terrible. I don't want to hear it. I don't want it on my that radio. That song was played to death, man. Oh, and it was bad. I don't know. I like that song. I don't like I don't, it. That whole album is sick, man. I don't like Most it. Of that album. Nope. I gotta say, that album's I don't like killer. it. But um, not my favorite type of music. Not my favorite <laughs> band. I wouldn't consider them rock. Mm-hmm. I don't consider them rock. Mm-hmm. I consider Maybe them like soft rock. Ugh. Soft. Elevator music. Right, right, right. <laughs> um, we move right along with Extreme. Uh, they have a, the next song on the album is called "The Mask," which reminds me of like Green Day's "American Idiot." There's a breakdown that reminds me of Cult of Personality by Living Color. Really good solo in it. The next song is called Thicker Than Blood. Um, reminds me of Filter. They get a little more, like I said, they, they're diverse. So you, mm-hmm. they can have songs that are like basically like some type of violets. Right. Like a Green Day-ish. Okay. Um, and now this one's like more of a uh, filter, like a new metal type feel. I feel like maybe they hung out with Korn for a couple of days. Um, then they have a song called Save Me. Going back, I said it's a new metal. Um kind of has like a disturbed type feel this kind of song's kind of cheesy um but it has like that nickelback kind of like you know catchy chorus you know um very 80s you know i picture them wearing sunglasses when they sing this like <laughs> yeah like that kind right, of like has right. like that kind of like <laughs> charm to it you know like um and everything the next song is called i think one of my favorites on the album it's a, a, another ballad it's called hurricane it's just I think I think Nuno and this and Gary switch like lead vocals on this. They do great harmonies yeah. and everything. It's a really beautiful song. It's um, you know very Beatles esque. You know, great solo. Um, if you're, I'm not really into the White Stripes at all, uh, but they have a song called "We We Just, we, we just Want to Be Friends" or "Let's Be Friends." I can't remember the exact title, but it has that kind of vibe. Just you know, that drums just kind right. of acoustic. I guess more than words type vibe. But it's very good. Then the next one is called X'd Out. This is very much like Muse. Um, kind of reminds me of Bjork's Army of Me. That's like one of her biggest right. songs. Very much like Filter. Um, Dream Theater, they have, a, they have similar to Dream Theater, they have a song called Never Enough. Very much like Muse. They have synthesizers, a synch- sequencer. I think he's using a seven string. That's why it has like that, ugh, that like right. beef in it. And a really good uh, solo. Reminds me of John Petrucci. Uh, that's a really cool song. Uh, that's a great song. They should, I think they should release that as their next, next single. That and Hurricane, I think they should be singles. Um, this next one is called Beautiful Girls. Like I said, they're very diverse. It's a diverse album. It sounds like 311. It's like a reggae song. Hmm. It has a beach vibe. You know, it's really like a pop song, really. Um, and then they end the album with a song. Um, it's called Here's to the Losers, which is... <laughs> <laughs> um, which sounds like the song uh, The Last Fight Belt by uh, Velvet Revolver, which is a great song. Um, and it has like a choir in it. And it's basically, it's about dealing with failure. Like, you know, like, you know, failures are part of life. Right. It doesn't mean life is over. That's where I got from it lyrically. There's a nice key change, uh, which we don't have in pop music anymore. Key change is right. pretty, you know, significant. You know, like someone like Sting from the police, they're kind of big with that. Right, like, right. The last chorus, they change it. And it's like, oh, you know. Yeah. But um, we don't really do that nowadays. But anyway, it's a great album. I definitely recommend this album. You don't have to be an extreme fan to like this 
you know, I guess I'm not, I can't, I can't really consider my, myself a fan of Extreme, but I guess I'm a fan of this fucking album. I'm just album. a fan of a couple of songs, not a fan yeah. of them. Uh, but this album is sick. Like, if you like, like, like I said, Stone Temple Pilots, Velvet Revolver, 311. I'll check it out. Um, yeah, this is a good yeah, song. This is a good album you play. Yeah. If you're going to work out, yeah. you'll be doing yard work, you know. Just have it on, yeah. kind of listen to it, get pumped up with it. I'll give yeah. it a listen. Maybe you're playing, uh, you know, cornhole or ping pong with your friends <laughs> in the backyard. Put this on, or if you're gonna work out, it's very, very good. And like I said, these are it's a very great album. It'd, it'd be uh, unfair of me to not give it a. Great you know, you mentioned game. singles that should be their next single. Do you remember when that was actually a thing when a band would come out with a single and you could yeah. buy the single? Yes. That was like you would go to like yeah. a Sam Goody or, or yeah. something like yeah. that, and, yeah, 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 and you would buy this either the cassette or the CD, but it would only have like one song on it. Yeah, I have. Um, my brother got it years ago when Pearl Jam out. Came out with Last Kiss. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Cover. I actually still had the CD. It's, I think it might be have like a B side to it, which is like a two track song. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I guess you can just download. Now I guess one you just download the one song. So everything's iTunes technically a single on Spotify, iTunes. Yeah. You know? But I remember having to go and buy like the one song you wanted to hear a single. The album didn't come because those usually came out like before the album. And you wanted to buy the song, so you'd buy a couple of singles, yeah. and then the album might come out, and then you'd wind up having like ten copies of the same song. Mm-hmm. I wonder if that's why they they stopped doing that. Well, I think iTunes and the iTunes internet changed that. Yeah. You know, Napster. Yeah. <laughs> Napster. But now every band, now albums aren't as pushed anymore. No. You know, they're really more, you know, now they push singles. You yeah. Know, and um, they, you know, if it is an album, I find them more shorter, which is fine. You know, more like, I don't want to say EP, which is only like maybe five or six songs. But but I um, think most albums have only eight to ten songs on them these days. There's not You're yeah. not getting albums where it's like 15 to 20 songs yeah, anymore. no way. Remember, remember when you used to get like an album to be like a double album? You get like yeah, two, two discs CD, and you get yeah. like 50 songs on there? Mm-hmm. No band is doing that anymore. No, no way. No artist is doing that anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, I remember singles. Yeah. Uh, so, PJ, I'm really ex- I'm, I'm, um, um, I'm excited. I'm nervous <laughs> about your review of the play. And I wanted to see this. I'm still going to see this in the theaters, hopefully, in time before. I know it's not doing well it's financially. It's not doing well. There's a and reason I, for that. And I, I, well, I, well, maybe we can talk about that. There's a couple of reasons for I that, think yeah. number one is you ha- there's no um, – we know that universe isn't going to last because you know, they're rebooting it with right. James Gunn. And there's, there's no, no stakes in the movie. You can't care about these characters because you already know they're getting right. rid of them. So – that's a problem. And no one liked those other movies. Those movies right. are terrible. No, they made no money, so to continue it makes no sense. Ezra Miller did this no favors by becoming crazy. I don't know. I like, think they couldn't reshoot. They couldn't they, reshoot. There they was no way to reshoot too much. It was too much of a... Uh, oh, it would be impossible. But no, it's... I don't know, I'm jumping all around here, but I'm sure you heard about they had a Batgirl movie. Yep. With, what was his name? Uh, uh, Brendan Fraser was going to be it. He was going to be, be like Firefly. Fire, right. Yes. They show that entire movie they so got somewhere on a reel to reel or on a fucking hard drive is that in whole movie. movie and they hit delete <laughs> right right yeah. they, but they that's a big write off yeah know? whatever fifty million whatever I don't know but I guess for this they felt it was worth putting out right you know because they look maybe they, maybe they looked at it I mean clearly it must have been horrendous whatever they looked I have I seen I haven't seen any like. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, I haven't seen but, any video or anything. I've seen some pr- production stills of that yeah. background movie. But and not to release, even you just release it to a Netflix. Uh, yeah, put it on like HBO Max yes. or something. Why yeah. not get something out of it? But, but, um, it, uh, the Flash, I think, was supposed to kind of sort of tie into that a little bit because of Michael Keaton. Because uh, Michael Keaton was supposed to be in the background movie as Batman. Uh, and I'm wondering if the real reason after seeing this movie that that background movie didn't come out. Right is is more along the lines of what happened in the Flash movie. Mm. So, I'll start off by saying this: I love the character of the Flash, the comic right. book character. I, I think he's one of the best DC characters in, in comic books. Um, I have in my office a production cell from the Super Friends of the Flash, so I'm a fan of the Flash. I went into this movie really wanting to like it, mm-hmm. and then I saw the movie. It was not great. I will start off. <laughs> I'm not going to bury the lead here. I did not think this movie was great. So, spoilers for anyone who is listening. By the time this episode comes out, the movie will have been out for like two weeks. So I feel as though I can talk a little bit more about the plot than usual in our reviews. So, again, spoilers coming up. The movie kind of starts off um, with, if you know anything about The Flash, Barry Allen, in the comics, he's always late, right? So the movie kind of starts off with that. He's late to getting to work. He goes to the coffee shop that he normally goes to. The barista that normally makes his order 
isn't there and he has to deal with somebody else who doesn't know what he wants, so it's taking longer than usual, right? That's how it kind of starts off, right? which is a fine premise for The Flash, right? He, yeah. The fastest man alive is getting somewhere late. Mm-hmm. Fine. He gets a call, and I, I'm not going to go too deep into the plot, but just to set it up, he gets a call from Alfred, who is uh, Jeremy Irons reprising his role as Alfred from the, the Snyderverse of DC films. Batman needs his help in Gotham City. Um, because there's a, a hospital falling into a sinkhole. The Flash is like, why can't you get Superman? And Superman is, in this universe, Henry Cavill. And they throw away line, he's doing something else. You never get to see Henry Cavill, right? And then that's how it starts, and that's how you get into the action where he puts on his Flash suit and goes to the hospital. And this is when it starts to get a little goofy. Right off the bat, the first scene is him trying to save the hospital from going into the sinkhole. And, and the, there's babies flying out of the window. Babies. Little right, cartoon right, right. babies are flying out of the window. And the whole first action scene of the movie is the Flash catching the babies while they fly out of the window. At super speed, he puts a baby in a microwave so that the baby does has... Like, that was the, like a gag. But the, there's, the baby's about to get hit by, like, the glass from the shattered window. So the Flash puts one of the babies in a microwave to, uh, to protect him from getting hit by glass. And then he catches all the babies and he puts them on the ground and then he goes to help Batman, right? So I, I, I know... Wait, 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 he catches a baby, right? Yes. I don't mind... That. Okay, that's kind of like... Fine, or whatever, okay? But he catches a baby and he places one inside of a microwave? Yeah, he has a microwave. As, microwave. For, as, 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 as a way for safety? Yes. So, so wow. the building is collapsing. I can't believe they actually did that. So the ba- the building is collapsing. They all. F- the- I can see that maybe like in a comedy. This is a movie for kids. Like you don't want someone to take the little brother or sister. Put their baby in a microwave. All right. Well, wow. It was okay. yeah. So not that I'm offended, but I, but it's that's pretty, it, it's not like a comedy. It's not like you know right. Uh, it's, it's an off the wall. It immediately kind of movie. takes you out of the movie, you know? and you're like, what's happening right now? This is not what I what I signed on for. And I guess Ben Affleck is in it. Ben Affleck, yep. Ben There's Affleck. Jerry, you said yep. you mentioned Jeremy he's, Irons. Yeah, he's in it. There's a like a high speed car chase sort of a thing, and he's chasing down the bad guys. And he and Ben Affleck is in a blue and gray Batman suit, like you know, very comic book uh, yeah. derivative of what he would look like in the comics. He's on like a bat cycle. He's chasing the bad guys. The Flash goes to help him. Wonder Woman shows up to help. It's like a whole reunion, except for Superman because Warner Brothers for some reason hates Henry Cavill, and. And that's how you kick off the movie, right? You get a couple of cameos from some Snyderverse Justice League characters. You get an action scene. You get a baby in a microwave. You're off to the races, right? I'll start with that. That sets up the movie. From there, in my opinion, it's all very downhill. The Ezra Miller, as Barry Allen in, in this movie, for whatever reason was like the breakout character of the Justice League movies. People loved him. I think he's very grating on your nerves to listen to. I don't like I don't it. think. I don't know what. I think he. I actually think Ezra Miller's actually a good actor. Hear me out for a second. Yeah, when uh, he was, you know, he used to be in the movie, uh, he's in a movie called... Um, was he been Perks the Perks of Wolf? Yeah, he was yeah. very good in that. Yeah. So he was, you know, I mean, maybe that was 10 years ago now. He had, he, I think he's talented. Clearly he has mental health issues. So... Uh, I mean, but all that aside, he might be a great actor. I don't think he's great in this but, role. Oh, right. I was going to yeah, say, yeah, this I, movie, I don't know what they... You know, I don't know why, but he was very popular. Trying to make all, you know, we would say they try to make everything. They're trying to yeah. Hollywood is a bunch of copycats. They just want to make another Marvel esque. That's what you it is. Need to do that, and that's you what know? they try. Or you can make them funny, but not as irritating. This movie anymore. became very goofy, and he's it's very like an irritating. Huh? He's he's very very irritating to to watch, in my opinion. This whole movie has too much of him in it, and that's the problem. He's the star of the movie, right, and he's they, two of them. Cause, and there's cause two he goes of them back in time, right? right? So that's, so that's basically where the plot kicks off. So if anyone knows anything about The Flash or you've seen the other movies, the whole thing is his mother is murdered. The father, his father is uh, blamed for the murder, gets arrested. He becomes a, a crime tech or whatever, a CSI type of person to prove that his father is, is uh, not guilty, right? That's always the plot of every Flash comic book, every Flash TV show, every Flash movie. That's his origin. And they stick to that, All right. which is good. With the he comes up throughout the course of the movie with this plan where if he goes back in time he can stop his mother from being killed his father will never be in prison because his father is coming up on parole and they can't figure out a way to like prove right. he's innocent that's right, right. so this is like what if I go back in time and I stop my mother from ever being murdered then my father will never be in prison and I'll have both my parents so he tells this plan to Ben Affleck's Batman who says you can't do that because you're going to screw up everything and he gets 
the, the, the idea that he's going to do it anyway. And so he goes back in time. And it reminds me of Spider-Man, uh, was the one recently? I get mixed yeah. up Far From Home, whatever. The yeah. one multiverse kind of thing yeah, he wanted becomes, to save. Did he want to do that or? In the mul- Alec May, I can't remember it now. In the Spider-Man one, they just all kind of pop out of the universe because he wants to... Uh, yeah, he he wants everyone to kind of forget that he was Spider Man oh, or whatever. It, that's and, it. That's it. Yeah, that's it. Okay, and then, okay. then all the multiverse rips <laughs> open. Right. So in this one, he, right, you right. know, he's like, maybe I can save my mother by going back in time. Batman tells him it's a bad idea. He runs into a, a college friend who is played by Kiersey Clemens. It's his love interest who only has like maybe ten minutes in the movie at that. Very right. small role. I don't know what was the point of casting her in the movie if you're not going to give her a part. Um, I'm assuming it was set up for a sequel that's never going to happen and that's why we have her in the movie uh, she plays Iris uh, Iris West who is the longtime love interest of Barry Allen in the comic books she gives him this they're, they're out, they're talking, they run into each other and she kind of gives him this idea Well, of what if you don't stop your she doesn't say it, he just formulates the idea of right. maybe I won't stop my mother from being killed, I'll do something else that prevents it so that I don't interfere with the timeline this is where the movie falls apart for me and why I don't like it. I think it's very goofy. The whole plot of this movie, of the Flash going back in time to save his mother, that's fine. That's straight from the comic books. That's the Flashpoint right. series. His idea is, well, she was making us pasta dinner the day that... Um, this is this is the story. I, I can't say it any more clearly than this. It's, she was making pasta dinner the day she was um, uh, killed. But she forgot to buy the, the tomatoes. Don't get, don't let, don't let her eat ragu. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is what I'm saying. It becomes the. This is not. This is what it becomes. And so she realizes she forgot to buy tomatoes and sends the father to the store to get tomatoes. She gets murdered. The father comes home and now they blame him because he has no alibi. So what does the Flash do? He goes back in time and puts tomatoes in the cart. Uh, okay. All right. All right. All right. All right. Okay. Still, I know. I know. I know. It's, it's a stretch. It's a stretch. Keep this in the back of your mind because in a couple of minutes I'm going to tell you why this gets even worse, okay? So, maybe, he didn't, could have, maybe it's too bad he didn't do like a... Uh, anything else. Like a Back to the Future thing, write him a letter. Like, dear doc, yeah. or dear mom, <laughs> in 1955, you know, well, a gang of... Uh, <laughs> well, it's funny that you should bring up Back to oh, the Libyans. Future. <laughs> right. Because Back to the Future has a very big part in this movie. They bring it up? A lot. Wow. By preventing his mother from dying, right? Michael J. Fox never becomes Marty McFly. Eric Stoltz is Marty McFly. Wow. That becomes a very big plot point in the movie. They keep bringing it up as a, as a gag, like a recurring gag. Wow. That okay. Eric Stoltz is... So he's, you know, our Ezra Miller, our Flash, who came went back in time, remembers his universe and his timeline. So he brings up Back to the Future and he brings up Michael J. Fox and they're like... The guy from Family Ties? What are you talking about? Right, right. Eric Stoltz is Marty McFly. That's like that's yeah. how he learns the timeline is a little bit different. Right. Meet, then he meets his... Okay. It's a lot of just cheese. I don't know how else to say it. It's cheese and corn. It's right. very corny. Then he meets his, his, the, his past self who had both his parents, who's even more annoying version of Ezra Miller. And, you know, stuff happens, whatever... Our Flash loses the speed, the the Flash in the past gets the speed, whatever, whatever. Very conveniently find out that Ezra Miller comes back um, into time. The Flash, Barry Allen, comes back to the Man of Steel timeline right as General Zod from the Man of Steel is trying to take over. But because Barry fucks up the timeline, there's no Clark Kent. Mm. There's no Superman. So what are we going to do? The only thing Barry can do is find Batman for help. Right. In this universe, oh, it's Michael Keaton. Right. Okay. So we go to we go to Wayne Manor. Um and Wayne Manor is looks very much 1989 looking Wayne Manor as he's walking through the halls. You remember how in the the Tim Burton 89 Batman there's like all those suits of armor? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they have, have suits of armor oh, in shit. it. You mm. see the very long dinner table that she's like pass me the salt. Yeah, What'd you yeah. say? Can you pass the salt? Like that yeah. whole scene? Yeah. That you see like that kind of table, and then Alfred we, CGI. We don't see no. Alfred. That would have made things better. <laughs> we meet um, Bruce Wayne, Michael Keaton. Folks, I don't know how to tell you this. It's terrible. Uh, what? It the first introduction of, of Batman is awful. It's awful. Is his acting bad, or is this the way they introduce it? It's everything. Wow. I don't. I don't 
You've said it before. If someone gives you a shit script, the best actor can't do anything about it. Right. Here we are. So. Damn. The first time we meet Bruce Wayne, Michael Keaton, he looks like he... All right. So remember the first Jumanji? Yeah. And we meet Alan Parrish, Robin Williams? Yeah. And he has, like, crazy hair. Don't tell me he has a beard and everything. Crazy beard. We have the Alan Parrish version of the 1989 wow. Bruce Wayne. Wow. He's no longer Batman. Why is he no longer Batman? He said Gotham City is now the safest city on Earth. There's no reason for a Batman. They don't explain why he would become crazy and grow his hair out and his beard and not take care of himself and become a crazy old man. They give no explanation for that. You would think that wouldn't happen right. because he accomplished his mission in saving Gotham. Yeah. So why is he now a recluse? There's no reason for it. Yeah, well, like, maybe you want to like set up like a, like another orphanage for kids or set up a local right. baseball team. Or right. Like, <laughs> like there's no reason why he would go crazy. They don't give you a reason as to why he went crazy. They tell you he made the city safe. Right. He accomplishes his mission. And then goes crazy for no reason. Interesting. I guess they gave them a pretty lost purpose in life. <sighs> I guess. They don't actually ever explain it. And then this version of Bruce Wayne explains why the timeline is screwed up. Take a deep breath. It's terrible. Here we go. So let's talk about other time travel movies just very quickly. Avengers Endgame. Mm -hmm. They go back. And they have a whole explanation. You remember when they explain how time travel works? And they're like, well, you can't change the past and have it affect your future. Because when you go back to the past, now that's your future. Right. And they do like this whole thing. So basically, it branches off into a new timeline. Right. Or you have the back to the future where it was like, take a look at your photograph. You're going to disappear if you don't put right. things back in line. Mm -hmm. We all, or, or a Bill and Ted, which has no stakes at all, apparently. Right. You can just do whatever right. you want. Right, it's right, fine. right. This movie... Uh, they use spaghetti as the explanation for how time travel works. And in, in order to do this, Batman makes spaghetti. He's cooking spaghetti. And he explains that the, the spaghetti crosses each other when it's in the bowl. I'm not making this up. I'm not. You're giving me a look as <laughs> if I am... So picture a bowl of spaghetti. This is for the movie. You're trying to tell me Michael Keaton is like over... Hovering over a stove with noodles. Yes. Explaining how time travel works. Yes. This can't be made. This can't be right. This is what I'm what? telling you. So so picture in your mind's eye, if you will, a bowl of spaghetti. All right. You got it? You with me? So well, the way Michael Keaton explains this is every, every noodle of spaghetti is a timeline. Is a timeline. Right. But sometimes... They get intertwined or They something? get intertwined. Okay, so they get like like a telephone cord gets right. wrapped so up. Right, okay. so where those, those noodles um, intersect is a fixed point in time, which means something happens there that happens in every universe. Ah, okay, 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 okay. okay, okay. So it's just a really terrible demonstration okay. about this because it's spaghetti. Right. I, well, you explained it well, so I can kind of see how they needed some kind of visual. I know, but mm -hmm. it looks goofy as fuck. Um, All right. So there are certain things that must happen in every timeline, regardless of um, who, what you do. These things will always happen. So essentially, you know, Bruce Wayne's parents are always going to get murdered. That's like a fixed point in time in every universe. So no matter what you do, when you go to you get a new branch of a timeline because you've changed something, it might branch off from that point because that event has to happen. All right. Get right. Krypton okay. might always explode in every timeline. It might not be Superman, Clark Kent, Kal El, whatever that flies to Earth, but right, the right, planet right. is it's the, always, the, always going to be blown right, up. Right, all right, all right, 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 right. I got you. So okay. that's how the, the the spaghetti comes into play here, where they intersect. Is a that's how he explains the timeline. So what do we have to do? We have to put things back to put the spaghetti straight, so that we can get back to the normal timeline. So whatever Barry changes, essentially, he has to change back, or we won't be able to get back to the timeline. And because certain things have to happen, he did something to mess up a fixed point in time. Right. That's why the world is screwed up because he put the tomato can, and this is why I say it goes back to tomatoes again. Wow. The whole movie revolves around tomatoes and spaghetti. Right. It's wow. stupid. Right. It's right. very stupid. There's got to be a million better ways to do this. And and look, that's about as much as the plot as I'll really talk about at this point. Um, but. 
that that's a very small piece. That's the that's how the time travel is set up, and that's why we're doing it. Um, the acting for Michael Keaton, he's Batman. I don't feel like he's our 1989 Batman. I feel like he's a version of the 1989 Batman. Mm-hmm. Um, the CGI in the movie is pretty pretty awful. It doesn't take me out of the movie. Some people are like it's so bad. It's the, it's not that bad, but it is it is not the best. The plot is weak. It's predictable. You know halfway going in everything that's going to happen. All right. They have some cameos and stuff, you know, to show different universes. Mm-hmm. Um, those are very cool. They only take up maybe two, three minutes of the time. They're not. It's not. It's not cameo heavy the way Spider Man was. All right. But the plot is so just ridiculous and cheesy and over. And I wanted to like the movie. I'm one of the few who liked a lot of what Snyder did in his universe. This movie was to me. A waste of time. Zero stakes in it because you know these characters are never going anywhere, so you don't care what happens. It's everything is set up around a bowl of spaghetti, which is stupid. I didn't like that. <laughs> you wasted right. Michael Keaton's return. So, f- well, fast forward through all the other stuff that happens in the movie. Go see it. Some of it's worth watching. There are very cool moments. The movie itself is not great. There are very cool moments in the movie. Um, we eventually do what we do, and obviously. Spoiler alert here, we're putting the timeline back together. That's the plot of the movie. Yeah. So we do some stuff. We get back to the to the future, right? We're in our present timeline. Right. Everything seems like it's back to normal. Uh, Barry Allen gets a call from Bruce Wayne. Bruce Wayne's going to meet him somewhere. Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> Okay, go, go, go. You ready? Yeah. <laughs> so Bruce Wayne gets out of his fancy car... But it is not Ben Affleck. And it is not um, Michael Keaton. And it is not Val Kilmer. And it is not Christian Bale. And it is not Adam West. Who's left? Clooney? Yeah! Wow! George Clooney makes a surprise cameo at the end of this movie as Bruce Wayne. Holy shit. (laughs) Drink it in. Yeah, yeah, I mean... I mean, I think at the, at, from what – look, I haven't seen it yet and I'm not really, you know, triggered by – this is a movie I can, I can No, I thought the movie was the best part. Two seconds yeah, and I yeah, loved yeah. every minute of it. Right. So like um, like you said, this movie has no stakes. That's why I don't really feel yeah. that big of a deal about um, – and keep the other cameos maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm not going to – Right, yeah. but I think – I mean, I don't know what to say. It sounds like a movie that was kind of dead on arrival and – so. Uh, yeah, that's kind of what but it I mean, feels like, like. I guess this sounds, from what you're saying, and is this more of a movie that you would watch like on Netflix or HBO kind of thing? Is, I it, would, was it, is, it, is it worth yeah. seeing in theaters? Which is is it worth seeing in theaters? I mean, look, no. Um, so more of a rental kind if of it was on, or from If it's on HBO Max, I'm going to watch it again when it's on yeah. HBO Max. Yeah, It's not terrible. I, It just isn't good. You're right. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? It just yeah. exists. The reason why I say I think this might have played into that Batgirl cancellation mm. is I think they realized they weren't moving forward with this. In my estimation, and I have no way of knowing if this is real, I think the original ending was probably Michael Keaton stays as the older Batman. And then you would have your Batgirl movie with Michael Keaton in the same universe, right? But when they realized it wasn't going to move forward, they they reshoot the ending with a, a fun gag with George Clooney because right. you know you're not moving forward, but now the background movie would make no sense because you don't have Michael Keaton anymore. Right. And I think they just scrapped the whole thing because if it wasn't looking like it was going to be a good movie, the background movie, you've already you, you changed the ending, you end this universe, it's over. I think that's kind of why that background movie doesn't exist. Yeah, yeah. I think that the I give the movie at a ten at best a five. Yeah, five and right, a half. So it's an average. It's, it's an average. average. It's not terrible. Mm-hmm. It's just not good. Yeah, yeah. It's Ezra Miller is not a great role. Not great in this role. I didn't like him in the other movies. I think he's a little too grating on the nerves. Um, but the problem is, there's not much of an else of a cast in the movie. It's him right. and him. Like right. it's a, it's the two of them. So if you don't like him once, you don't like him twice. Right, right. So now y- your casting is. Ugh. So let me ask you this. Um... As you're wrapping up, do you have like a favorite part of the movie? Is there something you did like about it? Because it is a it is a five. So it's yeah, half yes. you did like. Yes, it. yes, yes, yes. I <laughs> so do. What did work? What did work? I think um, surprisingly enough, um, the Supergirl that they introduce in this movie is actually very awesome. Okay. Um, and 
the problem with the Supergirl character in the movie is that it should have been Henry Cavill. It would have made the movie better with Henry Cavill because mm-hmm. it would have had more of a tie to the other movies. But she was very good in the role. She was very likable. The scenes that she in, I personally think she kind of steals them. I thought she did a really excellent job. I think the action scenes were good. They bring back Michael Shannon as Zod. Yeah, that guy's a... And he's an incredible he's actor. He's a freaking great actor. Um, and oh the scenes God. where they kind of redo the, what happened to Man of Steel are very, very cool. Right. That whole fight scene. Um, there's like a whole battle. Um, some of what I liked is is I was trying not to spoil everything, but there is some stuff with the way the time travel happens. Right. Um, I think looks very cool. The cameos are very, very cool, the way they did them. Uh, I, there's one in there that's just fantastic. I won't spoil it, although it's all over the internet. You've yeah. probably already heard it. Um, those are very good. Um, there are some moments in the movie that you're like, those are cool moments. Like, there's just some, like, some imagery in the movie where you're like, oh, that looked really awesome. That feels awesome. I could see why they would do that. It's just... Right, right, right. You know, if you have a movie that's it's two and a half hours and you have a couple of good moments throughout that that kind of keeps you invested to see what happens yeah. next, but the rest of the movie falls apart. So it's like you can't yeah. really care about those. The moment is cool and then it passes and then you go back to not caring. The uh, the scene where there's a scene where they have to try and give Barry his powers back and that's really done well. Right. There are very cool parts. I mean, just seeing the old Batcave again. Yeah, the Batmobile. You see the right. Batmobile, right? Like there are moments like that. You know the the Batwing, the plane like in the sky over like the moon or whatever. Again, like there's a brief moment of that. That's cool. There's stuff in there to to really sink your teeth into. It's just like they didn't push it far enough and they didn't have the right. You, I'm gonna go back to something else that you've said. It doesn't have the right tone. Yeah. It doesn't have. It doesn't have the right tone, so it falls apart because you have this goofy movie that should have been a little bit more serious. Mm-hmm. And that's where it falls apart. Yeah. yeah. I give it a five out of ten. Definitely watch it on HBO Max when it comes out. If you, you know, if you're an AMC Stubbs member and you can get like a cheap movie on a Tuesday, yeah. And there's nothing else out. It doesn't hurt to see it in the theater. Right. But okay. don't make don't make this your special trip to the theater. But we do have Mm -hmm. a small bit of big news uh, to reveal today. Um, Coming soon to uh, uh, East Meadow Shopping Center near you, I'll be opening a comic book store soon called Cool Kids Comics and Toys. So uh, we're doing some renovations in the store um, so we can hopefully open up within a month or two. And within that comic book store will be our new Cool Kids Lunch Table Studios. We'll be broadcasting and recording from our own studio pretty soon. And I I just wanted to end our episode with some big news about opening a comic book store and having a a new home, a permanent studio for our show. How do you feel about that? PJ, it's very exciting. I want to congratulate you, too. That's a big thing. You you know, opening any kind of business or any kind of, you know, hey, taking any risk, you know. Hey, you're taking a risk, you know. You know, um... But I'm excited for our, our podcast because, like, obviously our production value is going to go up. Our videos would actually have yep. – our goal is to have more videos on our YouTube. And, um, yes, yeah, this is another exciting exciting chapter. And, you know, I'll say this to our listeners. You know, look, if you have a dream or, you know, you can't be – whatever it is. Whatever you want to do in life, you can't be waiting for the perfect time. There's no such thing as a perfect time. You it's have true. to go and do it. Yep. And you have to – obviously, look, it's easier said than done, you know, because it takes resources or whatever it is. And if you're trying to find someone to marry or something, I don't know, whatever, dating or you want to pursue a band, you want to become a painter or whatever, I don't know, whatever, whatever you want to do. Look, things take risks, but you can't be waiting for the perfect time, you know, and really, you really have to just believe in yourself. And you can't be afraid of failure because you know what? Failure is part of how you grow. <laughs> it's it it's true. It's very true. You know, the, the most important thing is, uh, you know, um, like you don't quit. And really, like I like to say, folks, is, uh, you know, um, you know, have support. I know that sometimes it's going to be difficult not having support that you might like here. Uh, I'm just, generally. Um, but, um, yeah, just you know, believe in yourself and don't let fa- don't let fear. We're talking about '90s stuff. Yeah. You think about the movie uh, Point Break, <laughs> and Bodie, Patrick Swayze character, tells uh, Keanu Reeves like uh, uh, hesitation, right? Uh, or fear leads to hesitation, and hesitation makes your greatest fears come alive. Yep. So don't let fear paralyze you. You know, um, fear isn't a bad thing, but um, but sometimes you gotta face those fears and. So yeah, so pretty soon there will be a, a cool kids comic book store. I'll link on our 
social media so you guys can find that. You can uh, follow that page. And then, you know, we'll have some more guests on the show. And our last guest, Mike Schlaff, got a lot of positive reviews. So we're going to have some more guests. We'll be able to bring him into the studio, which will be awesome. And uh, so big things are coming on the on the horizon for the, the cool kids. So yeah, folks. So uh, as we say, you know, same time, same table. See you next week. Boys and girls, lunchtime is over. Please visit PJ and Mike's website, coolkidslunchtable.podbean.com for more information. Follow the boys on all social media apps. Just search Cool Kids Lunch Table Podcast. Now get to class before you get to tension.